So let us find the kernel of the function phi is equal to uh, x y square i plus two x square y j j minus three y square z k. Okay. So let us solve this problem. We need to find the kernel for this. So solution. So what do you mean by the curl? Just write the definition. Okay. Curl phi is defined as how? Del cross phi, right? So what do you see? Uh, del cross phi. Del cross phi is nothing but it's a data end of i j k. Next here, first row should be filled with derivative, partial derivative with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to y, partial derivative with respect to z. Next terms of phi. Okay, these three terms you have to write. So x y square, next to x square y z, next minus three y square z. Okay. So this one is equal to, it is to find uh, determinant of the above matrix. So first write I into, so first uh, you have to apply this determinant, right? This determinant. Okay. So we'll apply that. Do by do y of here minus three y square z is there minus do by do z of two x square y z is there. Next minus j into so remove this. Next again you need to find determinant of this right do by do x of this term and do by do z of this term. So do by do x of here minus three y square z minus do by do z of <coughs> x y square. Next plus k into uh, do by do x. 2x square yz minus do by do y of x y square. Clear? So can anyone tell the derivative of this, all this? i into? Yes, i into? Minus 6yz. Minus 6yz. Minus, minus 2x square y. 2x square y. x square y. So because you are differentiating with respect to z. So, okay. Next you can take minus common here. So I'll get plus j. Plus, hmm. plus j to 0. You'll get 0, okay. Plus. Minus, plus uh, hmm. 0. 0, okay. Uh, plus k into... 4yz, 4xyz. 4xyz. Uh, minus 2xy. 2xy. So let us uh, simplify this. So minus i, I am taking common. So 6yz minus 2x square y. Next uh, here 0 plus k into 4xyz minus 2xy. So this much you'll get. So j term you won't get because uh, if you differentiate with respect to x here, x term is not there. So we have put zero. Similarly, whenever you differentiate with respect to z, here z term is not there. 
So we are going to put that also zero. So zero plus zero will get zero into j. That is zero j. So this will be the final answer. Del cross five. Okay. So can you try this problem? Oh, sorry. This is the same problem, no? Okay. Have you understood? Or uh, you need one more problem? Understood, sir. Understood. Yes, anyone? Anyone have doubt? Sir, so that final answer. Okay, sir. Yes, yes. Minus a. Huh? The final answer, sir. At the end. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Here, inside plus you will get. That's it, no? Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's all. Plus you'll get. That's it. Mm. Shall we go for next problem, or uh, uh, you want any extra problem on curl? We go for next concept. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. we have a theorem uh, based on gradient okay suppose if phi is a uh, scalar point function phi of x comma y comma z is a scalar function then gradient of phi is nothing but the vector normal to the surface phi of x comma y comma z equal to c okay so this is the theorem we need to uh, uh, prove okay so let us write the proof for this is my voice is getting echo yes sir, yes, sir. lots of it one minute <laughs> No. Still echoes. Why is breaking, sir? Why is breaking? Now. Now is it fine? Uh, yes, Why is kind of breaking, sir? Still, voice is breaking. Yes, sir. No, sir. I think you are an internet connection is uh, bad. I think we will see. We'll try to follow. I will send the record of this. Okay, no problem. If you are not able to listen properly, I will uh, at the end of the class I will say share the recorded video again. Sir, from the okay. first, you can share sir recordings. Huh? From first, from the, I didn't uh, made much. Actually, yesterday's class only I made. Today's class also I made. Huh? Oh, actually, yesterday and today's lesson. Okay, okay. I'll share in Google Classroom. Okay, okay. no problem. So first, let us understand what is this theorem. Okay. Suppose we are having a surface like this. Okay. If I draw a coordinate axis for this, it will be like this. Suppose uh, what we are going to prove, I'll tell. Okay, I have selected any point somewhere on the surface. Okay, suppose my point I have taken at here P. Okay, or anywhere. Now what I'll do is I'll draw the position vector. I think you know what is a position vector. Position vector is nothing but uh, any vector starts from origin. Okay, it's called a position vector. So I am drawing a position vector from origin to this p point. One minute. Okay. So this is my position vector. 
So I'm representing this one as with the vector as R of t. Okay. So this surface is called as phi of x comma y comma z. Okay. So then what he is saying is uh, if phi of x comma y comma z is a scalar function, then gradient phi is a normal to the surface. How will you prove the normal to the surface? So that means you need to draw the tangent of the surface at this uh, at this point, and you have to check the dot product between uh, the gradient of phi and this tangent vector. Okay. So if those two are perpendicular, then uh, our job is done. Correct. So I hope you know when uh, two vectors, vector A dot vector B, is equal to zero, then angle between a and b is 90 degrees okay this is what we are going to prove so we are going to find del phi dot tangent tangent how you get for this vector means derivative of that vector so dr of t divided by dt so which we have to prove it as zero Okay, so this we are going to prove here. So let us see how to prove it. So I'll start with uh, by taking the position vector as let R is a position vector. and r vector is defined as x of t i plus y of t j plus z of t k. Okay. Similarly, similarly phi of uh, x, x, y, z is a scalar function, right? It's a scalar function. Implies I need to find del phi, which is your gradient of phi. How you are going to define it? Do phi by do x i plus do phi by do y j plus do phi by do z k. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'll find the derivative of uh, r vector first. So, dr by dt. So, in the first class, I have discussed about derivative. How to do derivative? You have to apply derivative uh, for each and every term in that vector. So that means d x of t divided by dt i plus dy of t divided by dt j plus d by dt of z of t k. Okay, now I will find what is the dot product between these two del phi dot dr by dt is equal to, uh, let's do the dot product. So, do phi by do x i plus do phi by do y j plus do phi by do z k dot uh, one minute. d by dt of x of t i plus d by dt of 
y of t j plus d by dt of z of t k. So this one is equal to if you do the dot product between these two. So i j and k will vanish. I term will be multiplied by uh, I term. J term will be multiplied with J term, and K term will be multiplied with K term. So that means do phi by do x into d by dt of x of t plus do phi by do y into d by dt of y of t plus do phi by do z into do by do t of sorry d by d t of z of t so i am taking this equation as 1 so we got del phi dot d r by d t is equal to this value you got now take this equation as 1 now again i'll start from phi okay let given function phi is equal to sorry phi of x comma y comma z is equal to c where as we have defined our vector in terms of t right here also i am taking it as x is equal to x of t comma y equal to y of t plus sorry comma z is equal to z of t okay now implies here uh, if you remember or not in the last semester we have done one concept called uh, directional derivative sorry uh, direct derivative or total derivative correct so if phi is a function of three variables x y z next x y z are the function of t variable okay then what is the total derivative for this okay so that we are going to do now okay so let us see uh, what is the value of that d phi by if you differentiate this for both sides how much will get d by dt of phi of t phi of x comma y comma z Where x comma y comma z are the functions of t, so this will be zero, correct? So what is the total derivative of this? How to define? So you need to find the roots for phi to t, correct? We have three roots. So where phi is a function of three variable and x is a function of only one variable. So when you are going from one variable to many variables, you have to apply partial derivative. And one variable to same variable, uh, that means single variable, we have to apply normal derivative. So that means this one implies. Uh, so how to do? Do phi by do x into here x is a function of single variable. So you have to write d x by d t. Okay. Similarly, plus. do phi that means phi is a function of three variables right so you have to apply partial derivative for it so do y into dy by dt where x is a function of t just remember it next plus do phi by do z into dz by dt okay so this one is equal to zero you got okay take this equation as equation 2 okay so what is this equation which is equation 1 right so implies from equation 1 and 
delphi dot dr by dt is equal to zero. Clear. So therefore, gradient. One minute. implies gradient of phi is perpendicular to surface phi of x comma y comma z is equal to c got it so here why you got zero then a and b are any two vectors implies a dot b equal to zero implies angle between this vector is ninety or a vector is perpendicular to b vector. So this property we have used here. Then A and B are any two vectors, and dot product between these two is equal to zero implies A is perpendicular to B. So that means gradient phi is perpendicular to surface phi of x comma y comma z is equal to c. Clear? That is what we have to show you. It is not surface vector normal to the surface. Okay. So finally, we have shown that uh, gradient phi mm. is uh, perpendicular to the vector normal to the surface. Is it fine? Once again, can you explain it, sir? So here, nothing but uh, just uh, what I have did is here. Uh, you just observe what you understand what here he has uh, explained in the theorem. If phi of x comma y comma z is a scalar function, then gradient of phi is vector normal to the for surface phi of x comma y comma z, right? So suppose I have taken a surface where phi of x comma y comma z. So this is that surface, okay. And uh, uh, what I did is uh, directly we can't prove this as normal to the surface, okay. So for that sake, I have taken the position vector from origin. So from here to here, at one point it is intersecting, okay. So this is called the position vector at point P. So here p can be represented with the function p of x comma y comma z. This is a point on the surface. Okay. Now what I am going to do is, if you do the differentiation of this r vector, okay, this will be the tangent at this point. That means like this. Okay. So this line represents dr by dt. So this gives the tangent at this surface. And uh, if you find the gradient, okay, so they are saying that according to the geometrical meaning, this will be the direction where it will reach the maximum value. Okay, so and uh, this vector, this is called del phi. Okay, so now what we are going to do is this tangent vector and this del phi, if you are able to prove the dot product between these two is zero, then our job is done. Okay. So for that sake, what I did is I have taken position vector R of t is nothing but x of t i plus y of t j and z of t k. Okay. And where phi is a scalar function. So this is a position vector and this is a scalar function. If you are having a scalar function, I have taken gradient phi. So it is defined like this. Okay. Similarly, I have found derivative of this position vector, okay, dr by dt. 
So d by d x, uh, d by dt of x of t i plus d by dt of y of t j plus d by dt of z of t k. That means I have taken derivative of the position vector. Now I am taking the dot product between these two. So what you got del del phi dot dr by dt. If you take the dot product, how much you get? Do phi by do x i plus do phi by do y j plus do phi by do z k dot d by dt of x of t plus d by dt of y of t plus d by dt of z of t. So if you do the dot product between these two, you have to multiply only i terms to i term, j terms to j term, and k terms to k term. So I have multiplied term wise do phi by do x into d by dt of x of t. Do phi by do y into d by dt of y of t plus do phi by do z into d z by dt. Okay. Now we have taken this equation as one. Okay. Next, what I am going to do is again I am taking the given surface. This time I am finding derivative of this surface. Okay. So we are doing derivative with respect to one variable. And this phi is function of three variables, correct? So that means we are doing the total derivative of this function. Okay. So what do you mean by total derivative? In the last semester, we have studied right when phi is a function of three variables, and x, y, z are the function of single variable. Then how will you find the total derivative d by dt of phi? So first you have to Uh, find the roots for phi phi to t. Okay, we have three roots. Okay, whenever you are taking derivative from phi to x, okay, we have to observe which kind of function it is. It's a function of many variables or single variable. If it is function of single variable, you have to apply ordinary derivative. Whenever it function of several variables, you have to apply partial derivative. Here, phi is a function of x, y, z. So you have to apply partial derivative for this. Okay, that means do phi by do x into x is a function of single variable. So you have to apply ordinary derivative for this. Okay, so like this plus one more root phi to t. So through y you can go. So that means do phi by do y into do d y by dt plus do phi by do z into d z by dt. Okay, these are all the functions of t. Here x comma y comma z are the functions of t. Okay, so now we have compared equation one and equation two. So here uh, LHS value here equal to here right RHS value of first equation. So if these two are equal, then this value will be equal to zero, right? Because this value we got it as zero. Okay. So finally, we got del phi. Sorry, ah, uh, del phi dot d r by d t value as zero. Clear? So when dot product between any two vectors is zero, so in what happens? Thus, uh, the angle between those two vectors is ninety degrees. So here, here asked to us to show it is perpendicular to the surface. So that is what we have shown here at the end. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I'll go for next concept. So I need to prove uh, again one more theorem, and this is so much important. We need to prove divergence of gradient of phi is equal to del square phi. Okay. So we'll prove it. In the last class, I have shown what is the value of del square phi. Okay, so what is del square phi? What is the value of del square phi? So it is the second derivative of x with respect to. Sorry. Second derivative of phi with respect to x. Do square sorry, eight. Do square five by 
do x square plus do square phi by do y square plus do square phi by do z square. Okay, take this as equation one. So this is the definition of del square phi. Okay. So next uh, we need to find divergence of gradient. So I am taking L H S of the given equation. L H S is equal to divergence of gradient phi. Okay. So here divergence means you have to take the operator dot product. Again, the gradient of phi means del phi. So this is the overall meaning of divergence of gradient. So suppose if you are having divergence of a vector, so how will you prove? How will you uh, write in uh, symbolic form? Del dot, right? Del dot, whatever this vector is there, that vector will write. Similarly, gradient of a. Here a is a scalar function, so you have to apply direct del a. Okay, <coughs> that thing you have to remember. So that is what I have written here: symbolic representation of divergence and the gradient. Now expand this. So how much you'll get? This one is equal to. del means this operator right do by do x i plus do by do y j plus do by do z k dot del phi this definition is nothing but do phi do x i plus do phi by do y j plus do phi by do z k this is the definition of the gradient so this one is equal to we have to apply i terms to i term j terms to j term and k terms to k term okay so that means do by do x here i term is do phi by do x next plus do by do y of do phi by do y Plus do by do z of do phi by do z. So this one is equal to just find the second derivative. So with respect to x only, I did write in each term. With respect to x, with respect to y, and with respect to z. So what is this value? Do square phi by do x square plus do square phi by do y square. Plus do square phi by do z square. Yeah. Okay, so we have applied one more derivative for phi with respect to x, y, and z. So from equation one, what is this value? Do square phi by do x square plus do square phi by do y square plus Do square phi by do z square is equal to del square phi, right? So implies take this as equation two. Okay. So what is this? Del dot del phi, right? This is the value of this. So implies del dot del phi is equal to We got it as del square phi. So, which is nothing but divergence of gradient. Divergence of gradient phi is equal to del square phi. Yeah. So, in this way, how to prove? To make sure we're all on the same page, let's begin by talking about vector fields. Essentially, a vector field is what you get if you associate each point in space with a vector, some magnitude and direction. 
Maybe those vectors represent the velocities of particles of fluid at each point in space. Or maybe they represent the force of gravity at many different points in space. Or maybe a magnetic field strength. Quick note on drawing these. Often if you were to draw the whole thing. So it's common to basically lie a little and artificially shorten ones that are too long. Maybe using color to give some vague sense of length. Now in principle, vector fields in physics might change over time. In almost all real-world fluid flow, the velocities of particles in a given region of space will change over time in response to the surrounding context. Wind is not a constant, it comes in gusts. An electric field changes as the charged particles characterizing it move around. But here, we'll just be looking at static vector fields, which maybe you think of as describing a steady-state system. Also, while such vectors could in principle be three-dimensional, or even higher, we're just going to be looking at two dimensions. An important idea, which regularly goes unsaid, is that you can often understand a vector field which represents one physical phenomenon better by imagining what if it represented a different physical phenomenon. What if these vectors describing gravitational force instead defined a fluid flow? What would that flow look like? And what can the properties of that flow tell us about the original gravitational force? And what if the vectors defining a fluid flow were thought of as describing the downhill direction of a certain hill? Does such a hill even exist? And if so, what does it tell us about the original flow? These sorts of questions can be surprisingly helpful. For example, the ideas of divergence and curl are particularly viscerally understood when the vector field is thought of as representing fluid flow, even if the field you're looking at is really meant to describe something else, like an electric field. Here, take a look at this vector field and think of each vector as describing the velocity of a fluid at that point. Notice that when you do this, that fluid behaves in a very strange non-physical way. Around some points, like these ones, the fluid seems to just spring into existence from nothingness, as if there's some kind of source there. Some other points act more like sinks, where the fluid seems to disappear into nothingness. The divergence of a vector field at a particular point of the plane tells you how much this imagined fluid tends to flow out of or into small regions near it. For example, the divergence of our vector field evaluated at all of those points that act like sources will give a positive number. And it doesn't just have to be that all of the fluid is flowing away from that point. The divergence would also be positive if it was just that the fluid coming into it from one direction was slower than the flow coming out of it in another direction, since that would still insinuate a certain spontaneous generation. Now on the flip side, if in a small region around a point there seems to be more fluid flowing into it than out of it, the divergence at that point would be a negative number. Remember, this vector field is really a function that takes in two-dimensional inputs and spits out two-dimensional outputs. The divergence of that vector field gives you a new function, one that takes in a single 2D point as its input, but its output depends on the behavior of the field in a small neighborhood around that point. In this way, it's analogous to a derivative. And that output is just a single number, measuring how much that point acts as a source or a sink. I'm purposefully delaying discussion of computations here. The understanding for what it represents is more important. Notice, this means that for an actual physical fluid, like water, rather than some imagined one used to illustrate an arbitrary vector field, then if that fluid is incompressible, the velocity vector field must have a divergence of zero everywhere. That's an important constraint on what kinds of vector fields could solve real-world fluid flow problems. For the curl at a given point, you also think about the fluid flow around it, but this time, you ask how much that fluid tends to rotate around the point. As in, if you were to drop a twig in the fluid at that point, somehow fixing its center in place, would it tend to spin around? Regions where that rotation is clockwise are said to have positive curl, and regions where it's counterclockwise have negative curl. And it doesn't have to be that all of the vectors around the input are pointing counterclockwise or all of them are pointing clockwise. A point inside a region like this one, for example, would also have non-zero curl, since the flow is slow at the bottom but quick up top, resulting in a net clockwise influence.
And really, true proper curl is a three-dimensional idea, one where you associate each point in 3D space with a new vector characterizing the rotation around that point according to a certain right-hand rule. And I have plenty of content from my time at Khan Academy describing this in more detail if you want, but for our main purpose, I'll just be referring to the two-dimensional variant of curl, which associates each point in 2D space with a single number rather than a new vector. As I said, even though these intuitions are given in the context of fluid flow, both of these ideas are significant for other sorts of vector fields. One very important example is how electricity and magnetism are described by four special equations. These are known as Maxwell's equations, and they're written in the language of divergence and curl. This top one, for example, is Gauss's law, stating that the divergence of an electric field at a given point is proportional to the charge density at that point. Unpacking the intuition for this, you might imagine positively charged regions as acting like sources of some imagined fluid, and negatively charged regions as being the sinks of that fluid. And throughout parts of space where there is no charge, the fluid would be flowing incompressibly, just like water. Of course, there's not some literal electric fluid, but it's a very useful and a very pretty way to read an equation like this. Similarly, another important equation is that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero everywhere. And you can understand that by saying that if the field represents a fluid flow, that fluid would be incompressible with no sources and no sinks. It acts just like water. This also has the interpretation that magnetic monopoles, something that acts just like a north or a south end of a magnet in isolation, don't exist. There's nothing analogous to positive and negative charges in an electric field. Likewise, the last two equations tell us that the way that one of these fields changes depends on the curl of the other field. And really, this is a purely three-dimensional idea, and a little outside of our main focus here. But the point is that divergence and curl arise in contexts that are unrelated to flow. And side note, the back and forth from these last two equations is what gives rise to light waves. And quite often, these ideas are useful in contexts which don't even seem spatial in nature at first. To take a classic example that students of differential equations often study, let's say that you wanted to track the population sizes of two different species, where maybe one of them is a predator of another. The state of this system at a given time, meaning the two population sizes, could be thought of as a point in two-dimensional space, what you would call the phase space of this system. For a given pair of population sizes, these populations may be inclined to change based on things like how reproductive are the two species, or just how much does one of them enjoy eating the other one. These rates of change would typically be written analytically as a set of differential equations. It's okay if you don't understand these particular equations, I'm just throwing them up for those of you who are curious, and because replacing variables with pictures makes me laugh a little bit. Um, but the relevance here is that a nice way to visualize what such a set of equations is really saying is to associate each point on the plane, each pair of population sizes, with a vector indicating the rates of change for both variables. For example, when there are lots of foxes but relatively few rabbits, the number of foxes might tend to go down because of the constrained food supply, and the number of rabbits might also tend to go down because they're getting eaten by all of the foxes potentially at a rate that's faster than they can reproduce. So a given vector here is telling you how and how quickly a given pair of population sizes tends to change. Notice, this is a case where the vector field is not about physical space, but instead it's a representation of a certain dynamic system that has two variables and how that system evolves over time. This can maybe also give a sense for why mathematicians care about studying the geometry of higher dimensions. What if our system was tracking more than just two or three numbers? Now the flow associated with this field is called the phase flow for our differential equation. And it's a way to conceptualize, at a glance, how many possible starting states would evolve over time. Operations like divergence and curl can help to inform you about the system. Do the population sizes tend to converge towards a particular pair of numbers? Or are there some values that they diverge away from? Are there cyclic patterns? And are those cycles stable or unstable? To be perfectly honest with you, for something like this, you'd often want to bring in related tools beyond just divergence and curl. Those would give you the full story. But the frame of mind that practice with these two ideas brings you carries over well to studying setups like this with similar pieces of mathematical machinery. 
Now, if you really want to get a handle on these ideas, you'd want to learn how to compute them and to practice those computations. And I'll leave some links to where you can learn about this and practice if you want. Again, I did some videos and articles and worked examples for Khan Academy on this topic during my time there, so too much detail here will start to feel redundant for me. But there is one thing worth bringing up regarding the notation associated with these computations. Commonly, the divergence is written as a dot product between this upside-down triangle thing and your vector field function, and the curl is written as a similar cross product. Sometimes students are told that this is just a notational trick. Each computation involves a certain sum of certain derivatives, and treating this upside-down triangle as if it was a vector of derivative operators can be a helpful way to keep everything straight. But it is actually more than just a mnemonic device. There is a real connection between divergence and the dot product, and between curl and the cross product. Even though we won't be doing practice computations here, I would like to give you at least some vague sense for how these four ideas are connected. Imagine taking some small step from one point of your vector field to another. The vector at this new point will likely be a little bit different from the one at the first point. There will be some change to the function after that step, which you might see by subtracting off your original vector from that new one. And this kind of difference to your function over small steps is what differential calculus is all about. Now, the dot product gives you kind of a measure of how aligned two vectors are, right? Now, the dot product of your step vector with that difference vector that it causes tends to be positive in regions where the divergence is positive, and vice versa. In fact, in some sense, the divergence is a sort of average value for this dot product of a step with a change to the output that it causes over all possible step directions, assuming that things are rescaled appropriately. I mean, think about it. If a step in some direction causes a change to that vector in that same direction, this corresponds to a tendency for outward flow, for positive divergence. And on the flip side, if those dot products tend to be negative, meaning the difference vector is pointing in the opposite direction from the step vector, that corresponds with a tendency for inward flow, negative divergence. Similarly, remember that the cross product is a sort of measure for how perpendicular two vectors are. So the cross product of your step vector with the difference vector that it causes tends to be positive in regions where the curl is positive, and vice versa. You might think of the curl as a sort of average of this step vector difference vector cross product. If a step in some direction corresponds to a change perpendicular to that step, that corresponds to a tendency for flow rotation. So what do you mean by divergence means, suppose if you take any object, uh, the amount of particles flowing into that object and the amount of particles coming out from the object. So that is called the divergence. Okay, suppose if you take an object and the flow between uh, the particles is uh, in a rotational way or uh, the particle is moving around the uh, source. So that is called the curl of that object. Clear? So with this, I'm going to end the class. Uh, so thank you for attending the class. So if you have any doubts in that video, we can discuss in the tomorrow's class.